humans are social animals and isolation uh, causes mental problems. And that's true of experiments they've done on monkeys where they isolate monkeys. To, uh, they don't get hugs or touch and they go nuts. Yeah. Um, Cold Fusion Alive, the podcast for the Cold Fusion community. Discover practices, tools, techniques, tips and trends for modern Cold Fusion development. Brought to you by TerraTech, the Cold Fusion experts. Develop, secure, optimize. Here is your host, the founder of TerraTech, Michaela Light. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Jeff Kunkel, and we are going to talk about cold fusion mental helpers or how to stay sane during crises, which when we're recording this, there's a major lockdown, corona, economic depression, wacko crisis going on. And there's definitely a lot of people who are having some issues. So we wanted to help out with that. So welcome, Jeff. Hello. And uh, nice background you have there for those watching on video, Into the Box 2020. And yep. uh, we'll talk a bit more about that because I know you gave a talk there. And, um, but meanwhile, why don't we just remind listeners who you are? Uh, who, I'm, who are you in a nutshell? <laughs> uh, I'm Jeff Conkle. I'm a 33-year-old cold fusion developer. I've been developing for about six years. Uh, I work on a small e-commerce uh, company, an uh, in-house team. Um, one thing I I like to contribute to the cold fusion community, and I feel like my my expertise is higher in having men, like dealing with mental health than it is in cold fusion at the moment. So that's kind of where I've been focusing. So you've experienced some of these issues yourself in the past. Yes, absolutely. I, I've been diagnosed with anxiety and depression and with uh, a mild uh, case of obsessive compulsive disorder. So it's a, <laughs> What's it's a mild case of obsessive compulsive disorder. That means there, you organize your shoe closet once a year. <laughs> it's uh, it's there was there was this it was funny because the uh, the um counselor i was talking to about it they had a survey to take but it was a survey from uh a it was a college study but it, it very much felt like a buzzfeed quiz to see if you have ocd um mm. but it, i fell like right in the middle of their uh scale and it's i tend to it's more like if plans go off i tend to get more anxious or but unless the rituals it's it's more just mm. like when my schedule gets thrown it really will bother me more than a, a lot of mm. someone without that yeah so if you're editing cold fusion code and the indenting's off or the capitalization's inconsistent doesn't worry you at all uh i will take the time to change it but it doesn't yes. distress me like physically like okay. i will i will make it how i like it but okay. it, it if I'm in a hurry, if something has to be a hot fix, I can mm. look past it. <laughs> but it's like making. <laughs> but I think most CF developers have some OCD because yeah. to program, you have to pay attention to all those details. And I've always found, I mean, I understand the formatting of codes are relevant as far as the computer running it goes, right. but it often seems that messy code goes with hidden bugs and. Yeah. Sometimes when I clean up how the code looks, suddenly the bugs stare me in the face when they were a little hidden. Sort of like the um, dust bunny stare me in the face when I organize my shoe drawer. <laughs> um, okay, we're talking about mental health in the yeah. cold fusion community. Why, why are we talking about it today? Why now? Well, it's, it's always a good time to talk about mental health, but right now um, is particularly relevant with uh, the um, the lockdowns for coronavirus and the economic depression. Uh, like n normally we're looking at about 20% of Americans having uh, mental health 
issues uh, right now. 20%? Yeah. That means if you had 100 people in your company, 20 of them on average in a year have a mental illness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, wow. Uh, but that's, it's, that's in the past before things went crazy. What, what is it yeah. now? It's, uh, getting, it's approaching 60%. So one in three wow. or two in three uh, right now. Mm. Uh, and it's reporting about 30% depression, 30% uh, PTSD. Just it's a, What's it's a, PTSD every, for those who don't know the acronym? Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. It, it is so a, that's in, where they're, yeah, what is it? Tell us. It's an incredibly stressful time right now. Uh, so much is uncertain. And... Mm. A lot of people think of PTSD as something that happens like very far after it, it can, it can happen like days, weeks, like, cause when we're dealing with something like this, which is a very long uh, time period, it can, you can have PTSD before it's over. Like, mm. so this is during traumatic stress disorder or whatever the thing. Would <laughs> yeah. Be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and PTSD is something that people get from being abused or raped or um, yeah. being in a war is another common thing or being fired from a job is another common cause of it or being divorced, yeah. uh, death in the family. Those are all yeah, it's, it's most often associated with like a big, sudden traumatic experience, but mm. it, you can, you can ha suffer symptoms with things that are just, very stressful over mm -hmm. an extended period of time also. Mm. So yeah, definitely this coronavirus thing, the, the economic changes, the lockdown restrictions, the protests, yeah. all of that, the political chaos. Well, that's just normal, I guess. Um, <laughs> it feels like it nowadays. Yeah. And, and I think the thing with any of these mental illnesses, definitely with PTSD is if you had it once in the past, it, it's sort of like if you've, break an arm and then you stress it again at the gym, you can injure it again. And the same with PTSD. Yeah. If you had a bad experience, you were doing just fine. And then this comes along, it could, uh, you know, tip you over the edge, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. So who, who, who should be paying attention to this episode? Cause some people may be brushing off and saying, eh, I'm just interested in technical stuff, you know, all this mental health stuff. I don't want to have to think about it. But well, why, why is it important for every listener? We're looking to talk to people experiencing mental health issues, which is roughly 60% right now, but also people who interact and know people who are experiencing mental health issues. So odds are, if you know more than two people <laughs> right now, statistically, one of like uh, two out of three people are experiencing some sort of mental distress right now. So odds are if you will fall in the second category, if you're not feeling it yourself, just someone who is interacting. So, so, so it could be people listening themselves have some mental health issues. Uh, even if they don't realize it before hearing this episode, they might just be thinking they're stressed yeah. or, or whatever. But we'll, we'll talk about how to recognize it later. Or it could be people you work with, co-workers, teammates. Um, yeah. And anyone else who this is important to who, who's in the cold fusion community? How about CIOs, VPs of tech, managers, team leaders, project managers, maybe someone in your team is yes. not doing too well and it might be good to know the signs to spot so your team doesn't fall apart yeah absolutely. there can be pretty that, serious that, consequences we're going to talk about some extremely serious consequences later yeah. in the episode yeah so, that was uh, the initial uh impetus for writing the talk was coming from a work standpoint uh but like a lot of this will translate to personal relationships as well or just uh organizations like a, a church group or a volunteer system uh the, that'll all work out but it was definitely originally uh tailored to working as part of a team with subordinates and peers uh yeah 
and uh, how to be there for your uh, fellow, for your teammates, for your uh, employees. I think that's very important because, you know, this can affect people's performance in a team. It can affect whether they even stay at the company, yeah. how you respond to this. Uh, and ultimately it might lead to whether they stay on the planet or not. Um, yeah. So anyway, let's not get too heavy. We'll leave the heavy part for later. Yep. But uh, maybe we should just uh, step back a moment. I, I, what in your view is mental illness? And um... uh, Mental illness uh, is a, I believe this is a, uh, a, a summary of the APA definitions. Uh, Who's the APA? The American Psychological Association. All right. The, the big cheeses of mental health, in other yes. words. Um, uh, mental illness can be categorized as a significant change in thinking, emotion, and or behavior. Um, basically, a, a shift in how you normally uh, perceive the world and uh, react to the world, essentially. And it can... Uh, cause it can cause distress, uh, distress and problems functioning in social life uh, work environments um, family environments and not necessarily all of them so sometimes one or the other and sometimes all I know I, I personally tend to have more stress and mental health issues with work and social but with family I tend to mellow out so it, it can, it, if you're like, well, when I get home, I'm fine. You might still be experiencing some of this. Mm. So basically not happy, not functioning well in their life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the problem is because it's a mental thing, sometimes it's hard. You know, if we broke our leg, it would be so obvious to me and my teammates and my manager yeah, we wouldn't be questioning it, but because it's inside the mind, people can cover it up. People might have somewhat quirky personalities in the, you know, developer community. Yeah. It's um, the mental illness is just that it's illness. Like if if you broke your leg, if you had a cold, you you take something, you do something. Even sometimes with a cold, if you have like a, a milder uh, form, it might just be taking a couple days rest. But then you have up to the breaking your leg, the serious, like we need to really do something about this. So it's, it, it's like, it's like any other illness or uh, injury. It's needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Um, you know, we wouldn't, th I don't think anyone listening, if someone in their office, you know, broke their leg in their office or at home and was hobbling around without crutches or a, a thing, they wouldn't, you know, want to help out. Yeah. And similarly, if someone broke their own leg, they wouldn't even dream of not getting attention. But when it comes to mental illness, that's very common that people don't recognize the problem or don't want to seek help because of uh, various factors that we'll talk about later in the episode. But maybe we should just, you know, talk a little about it. There's a lot of different kinds of mental illness. Okay. What are yeah. the different kinds, Jeff? Um, the the top two I really focus on in the talk are anxiety and depression. Um, but we also have uh, bipolar affective disorder, schizophrenia and dementia in here. Cause these are the top five reported uh, mental illnesses uh, in the United States at the moment. Mm. Um, depression that APA has some book with, with hundreds of different oh, sub, sub varieties of these things, but what exactly is depression? Because we hear that word banded around. So many people take antidepressants. So. Yeah. Uh, depression is, it, it is a, a feeling of hopelessness. A, uh, apathy is often, is not necessarily the same as depression, but it often is paired with it where um, you just can't care about things and you feel a numbness. Um, depression also has a lot of, uh, self, uh, self, not necessarily self-harming thoughts, although that does come with it, but a lot of self-hatred. Like if you do something you perceive as 
bad or a mistake, you will have an internal monologue of just like, ah, oh, that you're terrible, you're the worst. Uh, that that is very common uh, with depression. It's almost like that self-talk lo not locks the sad feelings in place. Yes, it is very self-perpetuating that way. Mm. It's a bit like recursive programming, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get yourself in an infinite de depression loop. Yeah, and then it's hard to get out of it, you know, which is... But we'll talk about how to get out of these things. So what about a anxiety? Because, you know, is that just being worried or...? It's... It is, but it's more than that. Um, it's often paired with depression, but you can have it by itself. And it's a, like, it's a pervasive uh, worry. Uh, a par Paranoia is a good term. Although uh, one thing with anxiety is a lot of it is on things that is perfectly reasonable to worry about. Like right now, health is a big worry for a lot of people. And that's a reasonable thing to be worried about. But if it's the only thing you're thinking of, if you can't relieve it at all, if you can't go read a book or, you know, kind of tune out it, and it's constant, it can really start to affect you. And that's when we're starting to look at like, I have anxiety rather than I'm anxious or I'm worried. Right. So the same with depression, just being sad because, yeah. you know, your cat died and you were sad for a day or two or whatever. That's very different from feeling sad every single day when you wake up until you go to bed and thinking yeah. you're bad for being feeling sad. And the yeah. same thing with anxiety. If you, if you worry about the truck about to run you down as you jaywalk across the street, that's different from being anxious about every, you know, are there germs on everything or will my code right. break or is my boss about to fire me? Um, you know, without any, really rational reason for the anxiety yeah i know when i was first diagnosed with anxiety my biggest triggers were uh bills fi finances if uh, something like a uh, one of our vehicles broke down i would really spiral and like that's perfectly reasonable everyone needs to worry about paying their bills but mm. uh, it was to the point where it was i was getting so worried that i wasn't like performing well at work, which would make me more worried that I would be fired and not have a way to pay the bill. It just hit it. You can really, if you don't step back and take care of it, you can, you can almost uh, be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You worry so much that you cause what you're worrying about. Mm. Yeah, that would make sense. And that, that OCD you mentioned earlier, obsessive compulsive disorder that is related to anxiety or. It definitely is a cause for uh, so some people. It tends to, they tend to go together. Um, mm. I know when things, when I don't have all my ducks in a row, I definitely feel a little more anxious than when, uh, mm. than otherwise. Um, it's something you can learn to live with. And when you start to recognize your patterns with obsessive compulsive disorder, you can be like, oh, you, you know, I'm just, I'm being triggered by this. I need to, either step away or just be like, okay, I, right now I need to not worry about that. It's not the most important thing. Yeah. And I think there's also, I forget what that saying is about, you know, um, not, there are some things we can take action on and some things we can't and the things we can't, you just have to accept and there's no point worrying about stuff and, and this, this coronavirus is a perfect example As on an individual level there's probably not too much we can do to yeah uh change that you can take care of yourself your family the people in your house but other than that you just have to uh you know trust that other people are going to take care of themselves too yeah it'll, it'll all work out okay eventually yeah. um right well Let's talk about some of the causes of these mental illnesses. Yeah. Um, some of the biggest causes are, well, the, the number one is stress. Uh, just, mm. and it's, it's very, very generic stress, but that's, you know, it's, if you put stress on a machine or a, a limb, it will, it will break. It's, it's stress 
it's it's easy to separate the stress as in like bending uh, or breaking something versus stress the the mental stress. But it, it they're very very similar. If you put yourself under stress long enough, you 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 can experience issues and uh, and very very much physical issues as well, like exhaustion uh, and these these mental health issues. Um, and I know a lot of us just, you know, we have stress. We have, uh, we have crunch time at work. We have, uh, a, a bug that a piece of code that's been working for five years suddenly isn't, you know, the, we all have those and it's not so much avoiding stress as learning to kind of mitigate it, to, uh, to accept it and then put it behind you as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is isolation, which is a big thing right now. Um, it's All that working cool. from home. Yeah. St stay at home. Yeah. It's, uh, it, humans are meant to interact with each other. It's, I think we're still very much the same, the same animals that we're living in, you know, in tribes a couple hundred years ago, it's very much, we came up with, you know, you saw everyone you knew every day. And uh, now it's, we all know the hundreds to thousands of people. Uh, so you can't really do that, but it's just getting some sort of uh, interaction. And like right now it's going to be a lot of zoom calls, FaceTime, things like that. But uh, once we're in, out the other side of this it's a good idea to go out and you know get some face-to-face -face time with people that would be good <laughs> yeah. um and why so humans are social animals and isolation uh causes mental problems and that's true of experiments they've done on monkeys where they isolate monkeys to, uh, they don't get hugs or touch and they go nuts yeah. um so it's um, common. What, what else is a cause of uh, mental illness? Uh, another one is uh, poor nutrition. And mm. I've never of, seen a, a cold fusion programmer has poor nutrition. What were you thinking no, of then? Never. What kind of nutrition would be poor? Um, a lot of it can be, I know, particularly in this, we'll pair with the next one, which is lack of sunlight, is uh, vitamin intake. Um, mm. With a lot of our mental health issues are chemical imbalances. So when you have, when you aren't getting the required chemicals into your system, it can mess up your receptors. I know, uh, I personally, I was severely deficient in vitamin D when, uh, I was at my most depressed and, um, it's that, that one really affects your, uh, serotonin receptors which is how you feel happy so the fact that i wasn't eating enough vitamin d and getting enough sunlight was literally numbing my ability to feel happy so it's something that uh it, it's yeah it's something that, that uh is really important also just eating well will help you physically feel better and it, it's one of those like fe feeling better will help you feel better it's it sounds kind of like well duh but <laughs> if you take care of yourself in in this way it will help you feel better in mentally also I, I think it does two things there's the chemical thing in the brain but there's also the act of self-love that if i think yeah. i deserve to eat good food or get sunshine or whatever the other things are you know it, it kind of is opposite to um, you know, those negative spiral self thoughts that you were talking about. Yes. So, yes. Um, and what, what other, other things are causes of mental. Another, uh, big illness. one. And this is, this is where the, the list starts to sound like, I, I, I'm your mom. Like you need to, you need to <laughs> eat, you need to get sunshine, uh, but sleep and exercise. Like it's, you need to, it, while mental health is described as like purely a mental thing, it's, there are physical causes of it. And 
getting sleep and exercise, keeping your body in decent shape will, will really help. I know one of the, one of the best things for depression itself is exercise. Uh, um, I don't, I don't have this, this, the numbers on me offhand, but it's, it's not necessarily better than certain medications, but it will, it, it's, you won't find anyone discouraging it. It's like, this will help. Like you might need additional helpers, but like they're hands down. If you get into a habit of exercising and sleeping, right, it, it will improve your mood overall. And then, um, also there is the overindulgence, which is, it's one of those, a lot of, that's us a nice stuff. word. What, what does that mean? Overindulgence? Just, I'm not going to tell you it's wrong to drink, uh, smoke, whatnot. You, you all went to middle school health class, you know, you know, the situation. Um, but excess of the, of, uh, uh, mind altering, uh, chemicals will, well, alter your mind to a point. Uh, it's, easy to self-medicate because you can just go to the grocery store and pick up a six pack. Yeah. I don't have to see a doctor. I don't have to listen to anybody else. I can just go do that. But, and maybe if you're just feeling stress, that's fine. But if, if it's a pervasive thing, if you always go to that and you're feeling it every day, it can start to compound on itself. And it's just, like, I, I won't tell you what to do. I'm not your mom. But if, if you're feeling these things, these symptoms, and you're indulging often, th there could be a correlation. It's just something to kind of keep at the back of your mind. Of th like, this might be a cause. Or it, if not a cause, it's, it might not be helping as much as it feels like it is in the moment. Well, I, th I think a uh, few things there first of all is the chemical effect of whatever you're overindulging in whether that's mm -hmm. alcohol or marijuana or other drugs or prescription drugs or um or sugar for that matter that's another common overindulgence that some people yep. use to deal with mental illness um anyway there's a chemical effect on the brain and, and i read a book whose name escapes me right now but it had they did mris of people's brains who'd been on cocaine or alcohol or nicotine mm -hmm. or whatever the drug was and they actually were different and in some of the cases some of these drugs there were like swiss cheese holes of of non-firing neurons in the brain so it, it can cause you know a shift in in how yeah. the neurons fire in there and then secondly there's just the the addictive behavior which kind of ties into the ocd stuff I, i'm sure everyone has had or does have some addiction or another, whether yeah. it's one of those, you know, ke physical chemical things or it's online shopping or watching uh, porn or um, yeah. playing video games or, you know, social media clicking on, you know, whatever. I um, think that that's one that will be in a, a couple decades. We'll be looking back on, I think the social media, that's yeah. the, the one that's, it's still, it, it's like, it's been around for a while, but it's still so new that we just don't know how it's affecting us. Like, do you, do you it, think there'll be a time in the future where you, you go to get your social media and they'll ask for an ID to check your age? <laughs> Man, you, you know, you kn I wouldn't be surprised. I, I doubt it'll go that way, but there could be like, we're, we're already uh, seeing time limits being not enforced, but encouraged. Uh, mm. for social media and certain things. And I think that could be something where it's uh, almost it, it, almost like it's socially not acceptable to drink all day, every day. It'll start to be socially unacceptable to be on social media all day, every day. Like, mm. because it really can affect you, especially during uh, times like this when it's constant negative news, con constant uh, uh, stressors it really isn't i know i personally had to set uh twitter aside because i would be checking just the trending hashtags and it was never good news <laughs> like the last three months it has not been good news for three months so mm -hmm. it's one of those just like 
just got to leave it be. Uh, no, that's interesting because that's a piece of Twitter I never have ever checked and have no inclination to check. Uh, I, I just look at what friends have posted and I have some friends with a lot of CFers and I just keep up with CF news and yeah. Yeah, that, things I think are cool. Uh, the better um, way to do that. But the, these platforms do have deliberately, you know, addictive pieces to them. Uh, oh, and absolutely. I think just the general point on it, how do you know it's an addiction is do you feel good after you've indulged in it? And with social media, I know I usually, feel, after more than half an hour of it, I feel crappy. When yeah. I used to drink alcohol the next day when I had a hangover, I felt crappy. Um, you know, when I ate too, when I used to eat sugar, I gave sugar up last year. Um uh -huh for partly mood reasons, you know, but also to lose weight so I could fit in cuter clothes. Um, yeah, more power to you there. I definitely, I had cut out most sugar before the stay at home and I've definitely mm. fallen off the wagon a little now. And it's mm. one of the, like, I'm personally going to kind of be doing a reset on that uh, yeah. start very soon. Just like I got to get what I have out of the house and then not get any more. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, with all these addictions, if you feel bad after the activity or the next day, that's an indication that there's some addictive stuff going on there. And yeah. often they used to cut, you know, like you said, self-medicating, also covering stuff up, um, coping strategy. So um, or, or, or dealing with boredom is another one. You know, a lot of people yeah. have great difficulty dealing with boredom. And so they will check Twitter or drink a beer yeah. or smoke a joint or whatever the thing is. Cause often with boredom, the anxiety or depression thoughts percolate up. Um, anyway. And, um, yeah. And it, now, now is a great time to decide you're going to learn to knit or something. Cause it, it takes a very, <laughs> it's a very similar thing. You can kind yes. of your, it's very me mechanical, but then you yes. have something done. <laughs> like, yes. It's productive or, or programming, you know, yeah, okay. another potentially productive activity. So what, what should we look for, you know, probably in other people to see yeah. if they're um, it's, having mental illness? It's far easier to spot in other people. I know it, it'll it's often like be bad code, right, Jeff? <laughs> easier yeah. to spot bad code. And really these mental things, if you think of the brain as a programming system, you know, it's bugs in the system that, yeah. cause you know stuff and it's easier to spot other people's bugs than it is your own yeah my my teammates will tell you that for sure <laughs> <laughs> but uh things that that you can look for uh is someone has be become more withdrawn than they usually are like someone who's normally mm. boisterous very um participatory will start to kind of sit back and just listen or mm not listen even just kind of close off um, and if they're in person their eyes are glazed over yeah literally <laughs> yeah and uh also on on the opposite hand uh can be outbursts someone who's normally mm. very very calm very quiet could suddenly be screaming angry or and it's not always anger it could be uh crying uh sobbing um or someone who like never jokes around suddenly being, you know, very distracting during a meeting, all, like constantly uh, bringing attention to themselves. Um, another thing to look for are uh, cries for help, which this, this was a big thing that, that I had when uh, mm. I was first getting into the, the diagnoses was uh, dark, dark humor. Like I would make, you know, like, Oh, you know, just, I'll just, you know, take, take myself out. And I, I talked about it a lot to the point where I was joking. I was joking, but in hindsight, I know that I, I wanted kind of somebody to talk to me about it. And definitely mm -hmm. at the time, if you would have been like, are you okay? I would say you know, double thumbs up. Yes. Um, so it, it, that one's tough because there are people who just have a dark sense of humor and they're fine, but it, it is definitely if we're if we're just kind of making bullet points of things to look for. That's that's definitely one of them. Um, another one is a uh, 
poor attendance and performance. Uh, this particularly is with uh, coworkers or subordinates. Um, you will you'll find your they, they could like, suddenly be taking PTO a lot, like more more often than normal, um, or their their code their their output is significantly lower quality. Um, really, but the the biggest thing is somebody acting very different than they usually do. Like uh, all of these are like they've shifted. Um, and it might be sudden, it might be over time. That's uh, it, it all depends on how, how it's hitting them. And uh, also with the, uh, the poor attendance, you can, a lot of these will come with a physical illness almost, like a uh, exhaustion, uh, soreness, like you can, uh, and it's... It's like it's not like their depression is making you sore, but it's probably encouraging behavior that is. So it, it's they they often are paired together, but there's not necessarily a one to one correlation on that. There's actually research that shows a strong correlation between physical illness and mental illness. And there's a whole mind body uh, health movement that shows the two are strongly connected together. So yeah. Um, and, and it works both ways. You know, when people have depression or anxiety, it can turn up, you know, anxiety, they often have, uh, you know, stomach pains or ulcers or, or yep. constipated or diarrhea. Uh, those are all common, uh, things. Um, you know, another common association is backache, you know, but it works the other way. If you, if you injure yourself physically, or you have a physical disease, it often makes you feel like crap. <laughs> you know? So then you get mental illness. So. Uh, I, I've known a handful of different careers I've had. I've had a coworker that will have a, get a back injury and they'll mm -hmm. end up laid up for weeks at a time. And mm -hmm. almost always mental health pops its ugly head up there because mm -hmm. just someone who's, especially when I was working in uh, more active uh, jobs like uh I was a movie theater attendant. We were always up and we were wilding around and we were moving things. And then uh, a coworker had a back injury. Mm. And uh, well, it was more back injury flared up because it was from a previous job, but they, they were really feeling depressed during the time that they couldn't move. Like someone who's used mm. to every day being up and around, it, it can really, uh, <laughs> really put you down. Mm. And then there might be other changes in their behavior, you know, maybe they aren't eating or they're eating a lot more. And this is more in a family situation or a marriage. Yeah. You might notice those things, but they might have change in their sex behavior. They don't want it yeah. at all, or they want it every day, five times a day or. Yeah. Yeah. Sex drive um, is often uh, associated with uh, changes in yeah. sex drive. Yeah. Or they might be using more drugs than normal. Yeah. So all things to look out for in, in that situation. Um, you know, I, I didn't say this earlier, but when you were talking about the um, causes of mental illness, it sounded like the stereotypical cold fusion developer. Stressed, <laughs> work alone. They yeah. don't eat good. They're always eating Twinkies or whatever. They don't leave, they never get sunlight. They're in front of the computer the whole time. And they like working at night and sleeping in the day, ideally, if their boss would let yeah. them get away with it. They don't, they pull all nighters and they don't get enough sleep. They never exercise. And then they overindulge in, you know, this, that, and the other, you know, mainly things like sugar and Coke is the more polite yeah. way. But, you know, a, a lot of people do drink alcohol or smoke a lot. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a devel developer is is a very primed uh, career for a lot of these. Like you get, like you said, it checks every box and it's one of those that a lot of it, you're not going to be able to prevent like stress is part of the job, but it, again, it's uh, taking, uh, taking the time. Uh, one thing that can help a lot is uh, setting boundaries for yourself. Uh, it's like, Hey, I need I, this weekend, no, no working on the weekend, no working after 5 PM, whatever's, you know, convenient for 
uh, your situation, your team, but it's, yeah, that's, it's, it's one thing I love and dread about giving this talk at a tech conference is, is it, it is, it's like the, the portrait of everyone sitting in the room is the, uh, the list of causes of mental health issues. I mean, just to dra- dramatize this, I think everyone recognizes that people who, who are in the military and have gone into some war are at serious risk for mental illness yeah. and PTSD or suicide or whatever. But we don't think of people going into a cold fusion programming career as being at serious risk of mental illness. And perhaps we should. Yeah. You know? Yeah, a lot of... Uh... And it doesn't mean it's inevitable that people who program right. are going to have these things. It just means we need to be more aware because then there's more risk. It's a risky yeah, it, profession, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, there is like a kind of a societal feeling that in order to have mental health issues, you have to have literally been put through some truly traumatic uh, uh, experiences. But a lot of it is like the slow grind. There's like mm. the, the, the slow wearing away can cause this as well. And I think it just as we talk about it more, people open up with their personal experiences and be like, Oh, well, if, if they're feeling that, then may, maybe what I, what I'm feeling isn't so um, strange because like we were talking earlier with up to 60% of people reporting mental illnesses right now that, that 60% with, with two things, clinical depression or PTSD. Um, but the other 40% right now probably have some low level anxiety or yeah. other apathy or whatever going on. You know, yeah. there's usually a, there's a, a, what do you call it? A scale or a spectrum of depression, for example, yeah. you know, can go from listlessness to like, you know, suicidal thoughts. So yeah. anyway, sorry. I, yeah. No, so it's, it's just, it's, it's very common, especially now. And it, it's easy to feel like, well, I'm some sort of, I'm some sort of weirdo. I'm the only one who feels like this. Mm. The numbers uh, would like to speak contrary to that. Like a lot of people, if not experiencing very serious uh, symptoms of this are experiencing at least minor right now. Like I don't, I don't personally know anyone that I interact with on a daily basis that doesn't have at least some mild level of anxiety right now. It's just a very, uh, it's a try and we're going through trying times. And I think well, some people every- have said it's, it's analogous to world war two without the war part and violence. But as yeah. far as the mental health aspect and disruption to society is, you know, a- and also on the good side, people pulling together and helping people out. Yeah. Yes. So. This podcast is brought to you by Terratech, the cold fusion experts develop, secure, optimize, Get detailed show notes on today's episode and your free CF Alive Modern Cold Fusion Guide at terratech.com. That is T E R A T E C H dot C O M. And now back to today's show. Um, so, you know, if we think someone on our team um, is having these issues, how, how can we help? Okay. Um, one, I think probably one of the best ones is to just be a resource for your team, be someone that they're comfortable coming to you. Like if they're comfortable coming to you for code issues, for policy issues, it they'll be more primed to talk to you about personal issues. And so just be, being a, a resource for for your teammates is helpful. Um, In the case of a manager, does that mean like an open door kind of? Kind that of can, can be. I know. Uh, day or when you have offices. Yeah. I know where, where I currently work, we have uh, weekly check-ins, uh, mm-hmm. one-on-one 
which is nice. And that, that's just a, a nice policy in general, but it's great to have a, like, I know in on Tuesday, I'm going to have a closed door meeting with my supervisor. So if there's something that's eating at me, I, I definitely have a safe window that I'm, I'm going to be there anyway. Um, so just, if not having an open door, having like set, Hey, we're going to, we're going to talk for a half hour for an hour once mm. a week. Um, and I, uh, I, I know some people who do agile, they have stand up. Yes. And one of the things is they do a brief, you know, 30 second check-in just so the team knows how other, you know, if another team member's having a bad day, they at least know about it. And the person's got to share that, Hey, that's what's going on. Yeah. Those are just encouraging communication within your team. Look, communication's good. It's a good idea to have communication in your team, but encouraging, like, just like, talking about how you're feeling, talking about just like, what did you do last night? Just, you know, don't spend a whole lot of time on it, but just having daily check-ins are, are really excellent for opening people up, uh, feeling more comfortable with each other. Um, another thing, if you, if you personally have experience with uh, mental health uh, issues, relating those to your teammates, to someone who might be struggling, uh, can really help. I know that was what really got me to seek professional help was finding people who were feeling exactly the same way I was. And I, I'd be able to, they, they'd be like, Oh, you know, are you feeling this? I'd be like, yes, exactly. I thought, I thought that was unique and just kind of normalizing it just, Hey, you know, you feeling like this? Uh, yeah, I know that. I feel like that every day, like every other day. Just kind of being, yeah, re- making it more of a relatable experience. Um, and then, like, actually genuinely caring, <laughs> like, how they're doing. It's one of those, yes, it's because it affects output and the, the company, but like just having a, 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 an empathy, a, empathy or sympathy, depending on whether you actually have experienced it before, uh, to, to your coworker can really help just like to, to be there and, uh, open to them that way. Um, one thing, uh, just, uh, having maybe, once we're all allowed to go outside again, have having a group outing, like go do mini golf, something, something, you know, low pressure just to kind of a camaraderie. Cause it, it could be an isolation thing, especially if you have a, a newer employee who moved in from out of, uh, out of town, they, they might not be doing much after work outside of work hours. So just having groups, uh, think, uh, uh, having group activities or inviting them to, and it's not for everybody, but inviting them to a, a church function or something like that. Like that is a big source of community and camaraderie for a lot of people. Uh, another thing is to make reasonable accommodations. Uh, mo- most of, most of, most developers have a lot, of, a lot of flexibility with their schedule, but just making sure that if they're looking to seek professional help, that they, they can work that into their hours, that it isn't a detriment to them in the company that they're looking to help themselves. Or if you're in a, say like an open office and it gets really noisy, uh, allowing them to either move to somewhere. If, if you have, if you have another location available, cause not, not every company does, or just, you know, have, let, let them bring in a set of noise canceling headphones. Like, and again, like th- this is general advice. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of developers kind of already are in a situation where they can do those things, but it's just one of those, like, well, you know, if, if a certain part of the uh, work environment is making them feel uncomfortable or exacerbating their uh, mental health issue, just allowing them to alleviate it. And then, recommending 
they seek professional help. I know one, one of the big things is that I didn't realize was you can just go to a primary care physician. Uh, a lot of them are, have a, a low to mid, mid level uh, training in uh, mental health nowadays and can prescribe uh, mental health medicines right there in the office. Like I, I have not had to, I did not have to go to a psychologist to get my medications. I was just able to go same guy I go to for a uh, bad or a uh, bad flu or uh, stomach issues. He was able to uh, help me out with the, the mental health, but maybe you're more comfortable with a uh, therapist or a psychologist. You uh, a good place to start is your insurance will probably have a list of covered professionals uh, within their plan. Uh, often on the website, sometimes it's a phone number to call. Um, and then there's often a, uh, for each state, they have a uh, website for the board of licensed professionals. So maybe it's, they're not in your directly in your insurance, but if you find someone close to you, close to you where you live, it, it could be more financially beneficial either way. Um, Another another way is if you know someone who has sought uh, therapy, counseling, um, psychology, just like how did you how did you get hooked up with your doctor and just kind of keeping a uh, Rolodex of this is you know this is just some areas I can help point people, um, and we do have uh, a few links that we'll be including in the uh, notes that can uh, help you out. There's uh, traumaandhealing.com, Psychology Today, and uh, the the uh, Finding Therapy on the MH National MHA National uh, site. Cool. We'll put those on the show notes at terratech.com. Yeah. Um, now, those are all ways you can help people on your team. How, what are things to avoid doing? Because I, I think a lot of people don't know how to deal with this and they, they kind of make it worse. Yeah, yes. Um, so a, a lot of these will sound like common sense, but just take it from me, it, it happens, it pops up. Uh, blaming someone, just being like, why are you feeling like this? You know, just be happy. Uh, that, that's not, that's not going to help. Uh, or, you know, stop worrying. It's definitely uh, t- tough love. There's a lot of tough love mentality out there. And um, while, you know, walk it off can help with a side stitch or a, a muscle cramp, it, does not, it doesn't tend to pair well with uh, me- mental issues. It can most often exacerbate them. Um, another is panic. Just be like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, we need to... We need to get, you know, have you committed? We need to just like calm down. It's, it's not, it's often more mild than that. And especially someone with anxiety, if you like raise your anxiety level, it, it'll, you'll start building off of each other and it can, it can really spiral out. Um, diagnose. Uh, you probably, you, we we can make educated guesses on how how people are feeling, but the minute you're like, you have this problem, it, it's it's very finger pointy as I'm talking with my hands here, and it can it can be put off. It, they uh, people can be felt like they're being analyzed, kind of uh, coldly. If you're like, you know, I think you have this and you should do that, just kind of more empathizing and just like talking in how you're feeling and not clinical terms. As far as this goes, leave the, the clinical terms for the professionals. We're, we're looking to, to help. We're not looking to like solve. It's a, uh, it, it's a fine line because you, you want their issue ultimately to be solved, but more often than not, it's going to have to come from them to do the, the solving. Um, and 
there's also another thing that we should avoid is excuse poor performance. And that, that sounds counter to something we said earlier where you need to be accommodating. You do. But if, if, you, if you're accommodating and you've really put yourself out there to help them and they're not making an effort to improve, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a job. Like you, you signed a contract when you started. It's uh, to, like when we're not in crazy Corona depression times, it's 20% of people are that people make it, they work, they work with this. Um, a lot of people have like a lot of these mental issues. They don't just go away. It's just something you kind of li- uh, learn to adapt to. And if, if you've, if you've made every effort to help someone to guide them towards a, uh, a professional it might be time. Uh, hopefully you have an HR department or someone above you that you can like begin to then go down that road. Um, but it might be to the point where you are the person who has to decide and it's, it's never going to be easy. That That is going to be particularly difficult, but it, it's, you can't, you, you can't let the, the team fail because someone wasn't willing to uh, help themselves. Um, <laughs> another thing not to do, make light joke. Uh, it's mm. this stuff because a lot of people with mental health issues, I know myself included, will make jokes, uh, will make light of it. And that's, that's a good way to kind of blow off some of the tension that comes with, uh, with mental uh, mental health issues, but the minute you start joking about them, being like, "Oh, Jeff, he's crazy," it can, it can really uh, just, yeah, maybe this that crazy word's not a good word to use. No, has a lot <laughs> loaded. Um, yeah, there's a yeah, and that that like words like crazy. It, even ones that sound silly and fun, bonkers, things like that, that can just, it, there's a lot of shame associated with those words and you just mm. want to avoid them. Like just it, joke about something else. It, it's just maybe, maybe the person is fine with it, but if not, it, it's a, it's a big risk to take. Honestly, if, if you think someone is suffering to, to joke about it, is yeah maybe maybe it helps them blow off steam but if it doesn't it, it's really mean <laughs> essentially mm-hmm. and that doesn't mean it's okay to make jokes that are not about their mental illness and help, try and help them you know yeah levity a helps a lot uh just yeah. joking but like maybe don't try try not to make them the butt of the joke mm-hmm. so what are some pitfalls with you know, trying to help people out. Yeah, this, there, there's a reason there's some stigma around this because it's not easy. Like if you, if you, if you've decided that you're going to try to be someone people can go to with mental health issues at your company there, it's going to, it's something you're taking upon yourself. It's definitely, there are difficulties. And um, namely one, some people don't want help. They, they either, are aware of their issues and are trying to deal with it on their own and would like to keep that private or their the denial is a, is a very big thing in uh, mental health. And they might, they, they might be less likely to come to you if, uh, if they're in denial and you kind of like broke the subject. Um, it's, it's ideally you've, created an environment where they can come to you with something like this, but it might be you, you want to, you want to tread very lightly. If you're, uh, if you're bringing it up first, just like things like, how are you? You know, talk to me about, you know, you, you seem a little down. Don't be like, I think you're depressed because that coming right out of the gate, you can really, uh, (laughs) can really, uh, push people away. Um, and it can also be, 
very uncomfortable. Like some people, like a lot of us have mental health issues because of just kind of the daily grind, things like that. But especially with uh, things like post-traumatic stress, stress disorder, it, you might be biting off a little more that you, you can chew. Some people's, uh, you need to be ready for like some, some real horror stories sometimes. And maybe just to, to be comforting and then kind of move them towards pr- professionals earlier uh, when it gets to that situation. Cause like, I, yeah, it, it can get dark. Like a lot of this, especially with depression can get very dark. Um, anxiety, a little less. So that's more, more your, your worries, but the depression can be depressing. Uh, what do you know? I think anxieties can be anxiety making. If someone talks extensively about their anxieties, it can be catching. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But um, yeah, and it's just it, there's a lot of uncomfortableness around mental health. Uh, just mm. having a mental health issue is uncomfortable. It's like inherently uncomfortable. It's what your emotions not behaving the way you're used to they're supposed to Mm -hmm. and then to so so there's uncomfortableness having it and talking about it and just being with someone who's experiencing it they can they people with mental health issues people experiencing stress can be a cause of stress it's it's very tough. Like, well, I, I think just in general, a lot of people are not good discussing emotions in general, whether they're, yeah. you know, dark ones or light ones, you know? So, you know, that EQ emotional intelligence is something that a fair chunk of developers, you know, by, by default have pretty low EQ. And, yeah. you know, a lot of us work on improving that and, anyone who wants to shift their career into working with clients more or project management or team leading or other higher areas of management definitely needs to work on their emotional intelligence and how well yeah. they communicate and how well they can deal with these things. And, uh, and being okay with being uncomfortable is part of that. Yeah. Um, any other pitfalls? Um, because we're going to talk about the elephant in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but right before we hit that, just um, if you've reached out and, the, and someone is kind of hesitant, uh, forcing the issue can definitely make it worse. Like if you're like, Hey, no, talk to me about this. They're, they're not going to <laughs> like, it's, it, it, it is a slow process. It is baby steps all the way. And you have to accept that it's not going to like, not everyone is ready to be helped. And maybe, maybe they end up having to leave. Uh, maybe they'll, that will be an impetus for them to seek help, but it's, it, it is great to want to help and to be willing to help, but you have to be ready for someone to not want it. I think for me, the word that comes to mind is graceful, you know, offer help in a graceful way, be okay yeah. if they don't want it. Um, and, and then at least you've made the effort. And if the elephant comes into the room, you know, you did the best you could. Yeah. Um, and, and the may never be a, a totally right answer. It's not like programming a computer. This is dealing with other humans yep. and there often isn't a right answer. So anyway, let's pull the curtain back on this elephant that's in the room. Yep. What, what is the elephant? Uh, suicide. If you if you talk uh, about mental health, it's it's gonna come up. Mm. Um, suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the United States and the second in uh, thirty year olds, uh, male and female. It's wow. Yeah, on average, there are a uh, hundred and twenty nine suicides in the United States per day. So it's, it's a lot and a lot of people, a lot of, uh, it, it, it's tough. It's always, I always get a little, 
uh, trip over my words with this because it's you want to understand that this is some a part of a mental illness it and the 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 we were talking about with depression the uh the thought spirals and it can just get so bad that you end up with these suicidal uh Su- thoughts of suicide is what uh, it's often referred to when you're talking to a professional. It's just, they're not necessarily, it's just something that is pervasive uh, in your uh, mind. And it's sad. <laughs> it's very sad. It, but unfortunately, just until there's a entire societal shift into everyone talking about their feelings and being open with this it's it's gonna happen it's you will more than likely know someone or know someone who knows someone that has committed suicide it, then the longer you're in the career uh, on the planet you'll run into it it's just uh, an unfortunate fact that uh th- this is going to be something that pretty much everyone will be affected by. And so it's not just someone going postal in the post office. This could right. happen in any office or family. Yeah. And there are often like so, some people will talk about it. Some people will talk about it a lot. And that's a lot of the, uh, the c- sh- cries for help. But I, I, there have been people in my life peripherally, peripherally who gave no warning signs. I would have put them among the few that had no mental health issues, but they just were very good at hiding it and or denying it. And then suddenly they're gone. And it's, you can't, you can't blame yourself after, after the fact, like this isn't something you did. Uh, If you had, if you had been nicer, if you had, you know, reached out sooner you have no way of knowing if the, if it would have still panned out this way and uh, for your, for your own mental health and those uh, and the mental health of those around you, you, you just have to unfortunately accept the fact and mourn, like be sad. It's, you, you don't have to be like, well, whatever it's, you know, it's definitely something to take time and process, but, if you if you put it up too much of it on yourself, you, it can lead to personal uh, mental health issues, and just to be there and be supportive because odds are if you're part of a team, it's it's there's going to be ripples because of this because of suicide. Uh, you'll often need you probably need to be talking to the people in your team about it and just you What's know do trauma. Just yes yes that, that is a major cause of trauma being near someone who dies well however they die whether they have a, a terrible accident at work or a car accident yes. or they commit suicide uh or they're murdered um and and also you know i think that suicide number 129 129 a day forty thousand a year that's on previous year's data i believe the rate has increased Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I did find yeah. statistics that said between 1999 and 2014, the suicide rate, rate increased 24%. Uh, I don't know what it's done since 2014, but yeah. I imagine with all the stresses this year, it's probably going to yeah. go uh, up. And, um, and, and just, I'll just throw in the other statistics I've found and I'll put the link uh, to the site I found them in, but yeah. as well as 40,000 actual successful suicides, there were 1.4 million attempted suicides. And then there were additional self-injuries, which I don't know if that's cutting or some other, you know, uh, attempting to relieve the pain. And, and I think suicide, I mean, I've never committed suicide. No, I don't intend to, but uh, right. I have had suicidal thoughts uh, once in my life. I didn't like them. I decided that wasn't what I was going to do, but you can get into that yeah. loop. You're talking about in depression where it's, you, you're kind of in this recursive loop and it's hard to see any other way out. Um, but I think some of the suicides are pain relief. You know, they can't see any way to escape 
and this, yeah. is, this seems to be a way to stop the pain they're feeling. Yeah, um, it's a lot of a lot of the things we've talked about are preventing suicide. Just normalizing the t- the talking about your feelings, the mental health issues. Just having someone appear that knows how you feel can really help the feeling uh, the the feelings of pain, the feelings of being alone. If you know someone that is finding a way to cope outside of suicide, it, it gives a, it, it very much is a light at the end of the tunnel type situation. Um, it's just like, Oh, th- there's multiple ways to deal with this. It isn't, it, it can be, and mental health issues can be very isolating. You can feel very, very alone and, that that will exacerbate the uh, thoughts of suicide, unfortunately. Yeah, it's um, the, those stress, you know, those causes of mental illness we talked about early, earlier can uh, do that. So, yeah, if you if you're concerned, someone on your team or you yourself, uh, you know, is suicidal, you really do want to do an intervention yeah. um, because it's so final, you know. I mean, if someone's depressed and they can get therapy or, or do whatever they do to get better, you know, at least they had a bad patch in their life, but they got they got better. But with yeah. once they've committed suicide, there's not really a lot you can do. Yeah. And suicide attempts are not good for people, people's either their mental health, because there's a lot of lack of self-worth after someone's tried to commit suicide and died, and they couldn't even succeed at committing suicide, right? Yeah. And then physically, often the means depends on what mechanism they use to try and kill themselves. But taking drugs, for example, often can cause really bad physical uh, side effects. Yeah. So, yeah, you can end up with a per, uh, an additional permanent issue that is just going to make it harder to get over get over the initial causes. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to say that suicide count may not include people who, I don't know what quite the right phrase is, but constructive uh, accidents or killing. So they, they have a car accident and, right. yeah, it probably was suicide. Or, or what do they call that? Suicide by cop shooting you is another yeah. frequent thing, which is terrible. Yeah not just for the person who dies, but it's terrible for the cop who shot them because they have to go through, they get trauma. They have to go yeah. through it. They have to go off work. They have to go through all kinds of counseling. They have to prove that, yeah, it was justified. And it really, you know, that's a profession that has a very high mental health uh, yeah. issue and a high suicide rate itself, partly because of the stress and partly because of the access to firearms. So, um, yeah. And, uh, we talked about overindulgence uh, sometimes just st- stopping limiting yourself can be a form of suicide. If you just mm. party yourself into a suicide, it, it it's a common way to go, unfortunately. Yeah. Now I, I did an interview on the podcast with Jorge Reyes uh, about suicide. So I'll put the link to that episode in there where he talks in more detail about it. He had a terrible experience where he taught a cold fusion training class uh everyone was happy there was this guy in the class who you know seemed totally normal uh the monday after the class killed himself and you know um very sad situation anyway he he gave a lot of resources and and help and thoughts on that yeah but um let's all take a deep breath (sighs) let go that heavy elephant in the room um let's turn to self care. You know, how can we prevent this, um, in ourselves? Yeah. It's, uh, (laughs) the biggest thing is practice what you preach. Uh, all of this advice that we've given you to give to other people do (laughs) it's, uh, it's, uh, and I know I am not, I'm not perfect. I'm very much do as I say, not as I do. Um, but I'm getting better. Like I'm definitely sleeping more than I used to. I'm e- eating better. Well, maybe not the last couple of weeks, but how, how does one know if, if one has slept enough? That you really can go by the, the standards of the, you know, seven, to eight hours, but 
like it's something everyone needs to find for them for themselves because there are definitely people who can who can go on less some people who need more um i think it's a it's kind of, it's tough because it's it's almost a gut feeling thing like if you have a a uh, an exhaustion during the day just a if you're feeling yourself be foggy like a lot of these can just be mental health symptoms themselves but so that's one of the reasons if you if you get yourself enough sleep and have clarity there it can help uh, you get through some of the other things it's it's to, it, it's it's tough to quantify but it's definitely I think as you as you get older, as you get to know your body, you get a good feeling for when when you've slept enough. But it's you'll not. I mean, one if you're falling asleep, like I know uh, there was a period in time where <laughs> I worked on instead of a chair, one of the the exercise balls because I was falling asleep in my chair. And if you fall mm. asleep on an exercise ball, you end up on the floor. So that that was <laughs> the time that I needed to maybe sleep more. <laughs> I think part of the problem is America is chronically sleep deprived and it's a badge of honor among that many people to say, Oh, I only got so many hours sleep last night. Yeah. So a I lot. think there are, I think many people don't even know what it feels like to have had a good night's sleep. That's very true. And a lot in the, um, entrepreneurial, the, uh, tech, the Silicon Valley types, where like I slept two hours and got this much done today. It's like, yes, but how long <laughs> until that, that catches up to you, you can really bring yourself out and uh, mm-hmm. lead to a lot of what we've talked about today. Mm-hmm. I, I'd also add the amount of sleep I need varies by the day. If I had a stressful day or I'm feeling a bit sick uh, or what I call pre sick, yeah, uh, you know, I yeah. don't have a cold, but I feel like I might be coming down with something. I, if I want to avoid getting sick or avoid having mental health issues, I go to bed earlier. Yeah. So, uh, and also, uh, I know this is a bit controversial, but m- my view is every hour of sleep before midnight is worth twice the hours after midnight. And I, I can't totally explain that, but there's a deeper quality of sleep that occurs. And yeah. once the sun is up in the morning, um, I know for me, I, I tend to have, re- you know, less deep sleep. I know it's, uh, what is the term? C- circadian rhythms. Like uh, mm-hmm. it's, we e- evolved to, you know, it gets dark, you go to sleep. <laughs> like it, it's very much, our bodies are still built that way where before electricity, things like that. So it's, I don't know well, I don't know how you let- test that, but it's one of those, like if you kind of, go with the flow of the day naturally like naturally with uh Mm -hmm. and it's a lot of the uh the blue light after yeah yeah that kind of stuff like blue light after dark i mean that's why i'm wearing these these are not prescription glasses these are you know they're just yellow sunglasses and somewhere here these are people on video i've got you know these are my nighttime blue blocking glasses they're red yeah. And they really make a difference. I used to have difficulty going to sleep. I go and lie down in bed and my mind would be going round and round. And since I've been using these in the after dark, you know, when I use the computer or yeah. the phone or whatever, um, it's a lot easier. Uh, a lot of, for, uh, a lot of devices have added a, like a, a, I believe Apple calls it night, night shift mm-hmm. where it'll shift the tones on your, your screens mm-hmm. to cut the blue back. So it's, it's something that, people are becoming more and more aware of. And yeah, I have that feature turned on on all my devices. I will tell yeah, you the same. glasses are two or three times more effective than that setting. Yeah, because yeah, they... Uh, and also, and it's not, not just the, it's not just the screens, it's the fluorescent lights or LED lights that we have these yeah. days. They give off a lot of blue light. So, uh, and TVs, of course. Not that I watch yeah. that anymore, but um, yeah. Anyway, sorry, you, you were saying other self-care things before we went on the <laughs> sleep tangent. Hey, uh, and a- I will, just to, before I come off that, for people who are sleep deprived, the one place where people often, two places people often do get enough sleep. One is when they're on vacation and they, and just think how great you feel when you're, you're away on vacation, assuming you're not like getting totally plastered with alcohol or whatever. Right. But, 
you know, if you're able to get a good sleep and you're not worried and what have you. And the other time is when they're sick, you know, ironically. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, you don't usually feel great when you're getting all the sleep when you're sick. But, um, yeah, I know what you spend all day in bed and then the next day you're like, it's a miracle. I feel better. Sometimes it's, you do feel you're not sick anymore, but you've also gotten sleep. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, what other also, prevention self care? Yeah. Uh, the eating, eating right. We talked quite a bit about um, just be aware of what you're eating. It's, it's very easy to, um, kind of mindlessly eat and do something else. I know I like to separate myself from work. Like I had a bad habit of eating at my desk and you, you tend to eat things that are quick and easy. And a lot of those tend to not be so great for you. But like nowadays I will go and I will take the time. I will make, uh, uh I'm vegetarian. So I make a big salad and I'll just go mm. and kind of just do that. And, um, that tends to help keep me honest as far as eating good food is if I am focusing on the eating itself. Um, another thing is sunlight. Uh, we talked about the vitamins, uh, getting, getting your nutrition, getting sunlight, uh, even just taking a, a multivitamin, uh, can help. Like, uh, and I personally, I'll take a, a men's multivitamin and then a additional D vitamin. And it's, it, it, it does help. Well, I feel better all in all when I'm taking those daily than when I'm not. And then uh, also it, accept help from others. Like it, one of the biggest things, if you, if you want to be helpful to other people is recognize that you might need help. Uh, it's because all of these things, uh, denial being uh, pushing people away for this, you may very well be doing it yourself. It's, I know I did. I, it's one of the, some of the biggest hurdles I had to get over in my journey to seeking help was just kind of like being open to it. So let's talk about the thing that's going on a lot right now, which is new for a lot of people, which is working from home. Yep. Cause that can lead to a lot of mental illness if you're not prepared for it and not used to being isolated or the opposite of being isolated, maybe you're stuck with your spouse and your kids yeah. more as of the day than you care to be. You know, yeah. I know that sounds a bit mean, but like, you know, <laughs> it's, you, it you can be stressful. Yeah. It, we're, we're animals of habit. Like if you're, if you're used to like, I spend this amount of time with these people, I spend this amount of time with these people. As soon as that's thrown off, it can, it can really uh, mess up your, uh, your, your, just your mood, your stress levels. Um, so one thing, and the, these are things that you, you, a lot of people have been floating out there, but I, I like to put them in this talk just because it's very relevant right now. But um, when you're working from home, treat it like you're going to work. You get, get up, have your breakfast, shower, get dressed. It can help keep you in some of the schedules you're used to. Um, if at all possible, uh, have a separate work area. Uh, I know a lot of us are like remoting in like with log me in or something like that. So like the computer we relax on, we might play a game on is the same computer we're working on. Uh, and that mm -hmm. can just the mixing of relaxation and work can start to stress you out when you're trying to relax or relax you too much when you're trying to work. So it's, <laughs> it's a big ask for some people to be able to move, like either move their machine. Uh, the laptops are very, for, uh, very convenient for this. If you can like take it to another part of the house uh, and assuming you have another part of the house, not all of us are uh, uh, so lucky, but uh, that, that can if just you have be a, if you have a garden work for half an hour in the garden can be great. Oh yeah. Or a park, if if you're allowed to do that, you know. Yeah, so yeah, depending on uh, where you are. I mean, I've worked from from home for the last ten years, and um, I'm quite happy just being wherever I am. But I know a lot of other people who do this, and they love going. They you they can't do it now, but they used to like going to coffee shops or go outside. Um, like you're saying, have a place where you go do work. 
yeah, there are definitely some more unique challenges to working at home currently than uh, than generally. Uh, another thing is limit distractions. Um, that's a lot of us are home with family and just talking to them off the clock and just being like, hey, I am working. It's like this, we're going to need to kind of setting, we talked about setting boundaries earlier. Is It's very pertinent to this. I'm fortunate in that uh, my my partner is also in the tech field and I have my, my daughter is 10. So she, she, she wants attention, but she understands that it, we need to, you know, separate. And I will, I'll, I'll do like five, 10 minute breaks every hour, just touch base because, you know, it, it helps them too to have connection, especially with schooling being online right now. But, uh, it's just like, try to cause and do it when you're off the clock, have the conversation because if they, if they come in and they're distracting you and suddenly you blow up at them, like go away. That it's, it's not going to be great for the uh the mental health of the the house so it's just try to get out ahead of as many of these foreseeable issues as you can uh and one thing uh you still have facetime with uh colleagues like a lot of us are doing zoom and uh uh google meet and things like that it's becoming very prevalent and I just, and I found myself on days where I'm feeling uh, a little lower, I'll be tempted to just like uh, not do video or just let, you know, just kind of do it as a phone call. And the, I always know when I'm on a group call with regular, I mean, several masterminds where we get together every week, mm-hmm. you know, and talk about how to grow our business and what have you. And I can usually tell, unless they have bad internet reception, and that's why they've got their video off. Right. If they're feeling a bit down, there's a tendency to not show the video. Yeah. And that's, I think, just, we can't right now be face-to-face to to people, but it it does Mm -hmm. help. It creates a connection, a, uh, a shared empathy toward one another to just see the people, see how their face reacts when when they're thinking about things, when they're talking about things. Um, and another thing, uh, allow yourself to not be great at working from home. Like this is, it's a process and we're in it for the long haul. And just like, don't be like, well, I wore pajamas yesterday. That's it. I'll just wear them every day. Just be like, give yourself a break. It's fine. It's hard. It doesn't sound hard, but it, it definitely can be. So just it's, like, I think it's a skill. You know, being able to work well from home is a skill and the people, you know, I think a lot of people I know who, who were working in offices, their dream was to be able to work from home and not have to commute and not have to deal with that, all that office politics and other stuff and not have to wear a suit and tie or what have you. And yet when it turns up, it's like, oh, this isn't as easy as I thought it would be to stay focused and productive and not get depressed or uh, what have you. So yeah, it, it, I, I think it, be at home, it's, it, but it's not easy to get work done at home. Yeah. And um, it, I think it's a good skill to have. And I think it's something companies are going to be looking for that. Can you work productively and, and stay mentally healthy working from yeah. home? And that's a actually of, a, a, a good thing to look for in hiring people these days. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of headlines about, companies are saving money not having to have office spaces right now so this Mm -hmm. might the telecommuting position will probably be more common after this well and i know in our we do an annual state of the union cold fusion survey and a a lot of people have said you know one of their challenges to cfs is is you know getting a a cold fusion job well if you can work from home you, you've just, you know, a hundred times the number of opportunities you can work oh, for because you're not stuck, limited to your own city. So uh, it, I think, it, it, you know, that should eliminate that problem completely, in my view, assuming the, both sides, the employee and the employer are both cool with working at home and are, are good at it. Because yeah. the flip side of being 
a good employee or contractor working from home is you need a good boss who's good at working with people from because so many bosses want to see you know backsides on seats uh, and they're only looking at the ads in the office and not really looking at the results whereas when people work from home you've got to look at results yeah and, and coming back to that earlier point about you talked about communication with mental illness just in general with programming communication oh. is so important and working from home doubly so yes yeah it's uh i know we had there was there was a lot of back and forth uh in my current work situation with uh well if they're not in their chairs how do i know they're working they're just gonna you know they're just gonna waste the time and we fortunately had just moved we we're about six months into uh agile and using jira so we're like well if, if the little boxes are going across the board you know that work is getting done like and we we had operated a lot with when it's done it's done when we were in the office but now we're starting to set deadlines and stick to them and that that mm. helps it's like well did the, did they get the things done by the time they said they would and that that's it can help alleviate the uh it, it's it's a lack of it is a lack of trust but it comes from a like a reasonable standpoint like they just they want to know that the the money they're spending on their employees is being spent well and it's just kind of you have to develop the trust between you and and your supervisor and just be like you know i i will work because <laughs> it not not everyone does and they didn't when they were in an office either. They just disguised it, it better. Yeah, it's, it is way easier. To, it's very easy to hide that you're not working in an office when uh, all they're looking for is if you're there. <laughs> yeah. I, I think to me, the word that comes to me is proactive, proactive communication, proactive measurement of results, you know, proactive dealing with problems instead of letting yeah. them fester. Because you can't just walk by someone's cubicle and chat to them about it. You've got to bring it up. Yep. So, um, cool. Uh, well, I, I have a rant I want to add. Was there anything else you wanted to do before I go on my rant box? Go for it. I, I just think this, you know, where you said 20% of Americans in normal times have mental illness every year. Right now, it's way more than that. But why are we accepting that? as as a nation and I, I think it's as bad in many other western nations and um i think and it's great to like help people and to help them go to professionals and get help but i don't think we're asking ourselves as a society why is it one in five of our brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and sons and daughters have mental illness there's something wrong in our society that so many people are sick. If 20% of people were breaking their legs every effing year, we'd be like, hey, you know, there's the sidewalks are screwy or whatever the thing is. But yeah. because we don't want to talk about mental health, we kind of brush it under the carpet, we take drugs, we have addictions, we cover it up, we and we don't address it. And um, I'll just put out my own theory here. I think the, you know, the rat race, so to speak, you know, where... Yeah. People don't, you know, they, they work too hard and spend too much and don't look after their health and it all goes around in a circle. And that's supposed to be normal yeah. and admired that you, you don't look after your mental health. Um, I think that's part of the cause. And it's supported by our government, our schools, uh, our most corporations. They, they feed into this. So. Yeah. Um, I guess it's just me. This is my own view. <laughs> so, but I think it, it affects the cold fusion community. You know, the, I've oh, yeah. known people who've committed suicide. I've known people who've been depressed or anxious. Um, so I myself have had anxiety or OCD and I've had mild depression. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, it's uh, definitely, I've definitely yeah. seen it in my staff. There needs to be a a massive shift in how we all treat ourselves and each other. Uh, it's going to be it, it's going to be one person at a time. Uh, unfortunately, it's we're not. It's probably not going to come from the top down. 
Um, just because you know, the, the people the, know, there might the be a special tweet from our fearless leader. Yeah, that changes everything. But I, <laughs> you're probably right. It probably requires everyone. Yeah. to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, it's well. We we can hold. Ho- hope for that but it's probably going to be more productive to just one-on-one do your best and help each other out everybody bring each other up i i think if everyone listening to this episode took some small steps to on their own mental health or helping out others or recognizing it and if if it's within your power to shift some small part of of how you're work operates um you know then or or share this episode if that's uh you know another way to do it or some of the resources then Mm -hmm. that that can slowly shift this thing but it's a deep uh society um you know to give a metaphor a a programming floor in the way society is set up um You know, if if American society was a cold fusion server, I would say that um, it hasn't had an upgrade on the cold fusion or the OS for years. The code itself, the programming that people are put through at school is flawed and has bugs in it. The machine doesn't have enough, you know, RAM or or hard disk space and it's kind of pushing the limits. Uh, The whole computer is overclocked to the point where it's burning out and yeah. it, it needs a reset like you said and it needs some re- tuning and, and refactoring in the code if not total <laughs> rewrite as yeah. to what we think a normal a healthy society is and maybe that's something positive that's coming out of this these changes this year that ironically enough yeah, the it's... year is is 2020 and in eyeglasses, 2020 is clear vision. And yeah. maybe we're getting a little clearer vision about some of this stuff that is not the way we want to be. There's definitely, you could definitely consider this a, a hard reboot on a lot of our daily <laughs> processes. <laughs> like, yes. All right. Got off my rant box got that off my chest thank you for sharing that yeah no um, absolutely um I, I and i try to do what i can in my own company and and to, to not follow that programming of the rat race yeah and i know other people do that in their companies or in their teams you know as best they can so or in their families you know it's another yeah. place people do this yeah in in the last uh, few years of talking about mental health and things like that at uh, cold fusion conferences, I, I more a, a lot of people will come up to me and just be engaged in the topic, and that's that's great, that's excellent. And um, some of it is like, oh, I never you know never thought I'd hear something like this at a tech conference, and some of it is like I'm you know I think about this all the time, you know. So it's just getting it out there, getting it public is great. And, um, I just, I, I love, I love talking about it. It doesn't sound like a fun thing to talk about, but it, it can be cathartic just to kind of exercise it out. Just like, just to find fellow human beings that have experienced this stuff. Well, a part of it's being okay talking about this stuff. Part of it's having a language to talk about it with. Just imagine if, if you were trying to work on, coding something and you didn't have a way to describe variables or the different kinds of variables or database fields and you you had to kind of fumble around and add on top of that you were ashamed to even talk about programming how would you ever solve bugs or get anything done you you wouldn't you wouldn't have healthy programs and the same thing with mental health if we don't bring it out into the open if we don't have some language to talk about it don't have some frameworks like you were saying regular check-ins or you know whatever things are then how can we expect this morass of rat race crap to ever get cleaned up? Because it is like crap out of the rat, the big rats of the rat race are pooping the yeah. mental health of, of the citizens. Yeah. All right, let's give a disclaimer. I know you you wanted to say this earlier, but I held yeah, it back to uh, the end. <laughs> uh, it's disclaimer that I'm not a doctor. 
this is all I'm not just... a doctor either, and I don't play one on TV. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, these are things that I've personally found helpful, and things that I've seen in in articles and whatnot that I've implemented into my daily life. Uh, if if you're truly feeling that you have mental health issues, seek a professional. It's and we we talked about that earlier. Um, I, yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I'm not the end all be all on this stuff. This is uh, just how I get through, how I try to help. Excellent. Um, so let's wrap up the episode. Let's talk about cold fusion a bit. Why are you proud to use cold fusion, Jeff? It's, I think the, the thing that I, I'm most proud about with cold fusion is the community around it. Um, it, it was my first, uh, development language. Like I, I, I learned some HTML and CSS, uh, through a graphic design degree. Um, but very little com- like computing. And, um, it was, I was immediately, uh, accepted and people were excited to talk to someone who didn't know much about cold fusion. So it, it's, it's an excellent language to learn, especially if you only know CSS and HTML, because uh, you can you can start with tags. Uh, often we're moving away from that, but it's it's very easy to get up and go to just you know get a, a Lucy server up and running and play. Um, where uh, I did learn some some PHP in my time at school, and just I it didn't click the way. Uh, Cold Fusion did for me. I, I was I was making a you know production uh, software in my first at the end of my first month at the the company that I started learning Cold Fusion for. It's just it's in it's I love the people who work in it and I love working with it. It's I definitely I, I have to recommend it when people ask. Great. Now, some people say cold fusion itself is depressed and suicidal and about to die. And, and I don't believe that. I think it's a very alive and vibrant and modern language when you do it the right way. But the yeah. question to you is, what, what would it take to make cold fusion even more alive this year? This year, I think, and I don't have a lot of experience organizing things like this, but just like an outreach, something... So, something to get, uh, you know, baby developers just to get it out there. Because I know I didn't know about Cold Fusion until I was interviewing for a job that coded with it. And I think it's something I would have come across later. But um, just to kind of put it out there as something for people to start with. And it's things like... Uh, meetups there uh and whatnot just to get uh younger developers in and just show to show people to that it's so easy uh because like the the community and the code itself does a great job with it but it's the the getting it to the people to to see those things i think that uh would be very helpful I, I would just, I think Cold Fusion News Group's great. In this time of lockdown, pretty, I think all of them are letting people join their group meeting from anywhere in the world. Yep. Um, I also will mention conferences like Into the Box that we'll talk about in a moment. Yes, absolutely. And then Adobe does these webinar weeks that are great to, to go to. And then I'll also mention the Learn CF in a Week website, which even if you already know Cold Fusion, um, you know, they just refreshed that and added in some new co- features from 2018. Right. Cold Fusion. Uh, so they're all good resources. Um, but speaking of Into the Box, uh, tell, tell us what you enjoyed about Into the Box this year. Uh, Into the Box this year, they're, they're, they had this really interesting software where you were virtually in the conference, which was, it was really interesting. Um, I definitely prefer seeing people but it, it gave a reasonable facsimile of the experience even though we're all stuck in our houses right now so but just because the, you could meet other people's avatars yes. and chat with them or have a little video chat or whatever 
and yeah, there were and rooms like, you could go visit and you went to the room to hear the particular track that you went to and, and so on. Yeah, there was a way to just be like, hey, hey let's go meet in the cafeteria. or let, it, it, <laughs> it, it led to language that was very similar to being at a conference. It, it, it helped mm. feel like you were actually there. And uh, it's always like the, the information that's there is excellent. And um, the fact that they record everything is great because I will often find myself going back and uh, searching through the talks that I've been that I that I've in previous into the boxes and be like, I think we're gonna we're gonna implement continuous integration this year. Let me go watch everything on continuous integration over and over again. It's like because I tend to uh, repeat uh, repeat information helps it sink in for me. That's a great point. And they also had a Slack channel for the conference yes. uh, as part of the box team Slack group or whatever it's called. I'm not a Slack genius, but um, so that, that was handy and that's a continuing resource and that's open to anyone, whether you went to the conference or not. And, right. and also if you didn't make it to the conference, they have the recordings for sale. I think yep. right now they're $9.95 for all the recordings, which is an incredible deal. I think yes, that's absolutely. End of June. Um, so I'll put the into the box conference link in there. Um, I'll also add a link to the other, uh, podcast we did together. Uh, Oh my God, general Di anxiety disorder, which sort of relates to the anxiety yes. portion of this talk. Um, but if people want to find you online, what, what's the best way or ways to do that? Um, I'm most active on Twitter. Uh, it's, it, I don't have a professional Twitter handle yet, so it's still, uh, uh, nerdtastic nine sixteen eighty six. Uh, there is if if it's tough to remember that there there'll be a link for it in the uh, show notes. But uh, I, I'm very open to conversation on there and uh, Slack also. Uh, I'm in the Cold Fusion Slack and the Ortis Slack. You can find me in there with, with that strange number in your name. Yeah, you just... yep. it, it is. It, yeah, it's a, it's a uh, username from back in high school, but. Uh cool well <laughs> that's great so thanks so much for coming on the show jeff and thank you for having uh, me may you have you and all the listeners have wonderful mental health and yes. uh we will put all the show notes together at the terror tech site and look to see you on the podcast another time yeah detailed show notes on today's episode in your free CFA Live Modern Cold Fusion Guide at terratech.com. That is T-E-R-A-T-E-C-H dot C-O-M. Viva la CFA Live Revolution!